chairman of a meeting to summarize my hobby, which is strangeness. And I hope that you will bear with me for a few minutes what I have to say. I don't know if I was the best choice, but surely I'm uh, working in the field, as everyone knows. The I have a slightly different perspective on the subject, as I think most of the speakers of this morning. And I would like to define the perspective. Because that really changes slightly what, how, and how one discusses the subject. I would like to remind everyone that for 20 years, the high energy physics has been proving the existence of quarks, gluons, and color. I think that is not in dispute. If anyone here disputes it, please say it now. So it is not in dispute the natural hypothesis for heavy ion collision, degrees of freedom at sufficiently high energy, are freely moving quarks and gluons. And the issue in front of us is not if they are quarks and gluons, but if actually we may call it quark-gluon plasma. Or if it is so far away from equilibrium that such a simple description is not applicable. And therefore, when we compare different models and different predictions, it must be seen from this point in phase space. It's a very particular point in phase space. Now, therefore, our research objective must be, in principle, to falsify this point of view, or falsify the approach to equilibrium, rather than to seek tiny differences between different models. I mean, one has to be very, very much aware of that fact. And I should point out that the reason why we went to these heavy iron collisions, because we have really hoped to find simple answers rather than complicated individual particle collisions, cascades, RQMD, etc. It is the objective when we have many degrees of freedom is to find simplicity. And uh, this simplicity is reflected in few parameters only, which can determine the richness of many particle abundances, many different particle abundances. So uh, the fact is that we would like to minimize the number of parameters and maximize the number of, of our predictions. Therefore, this is answer to Johanna. It's not wise to combine many, many, many different particle abundances to some one number which is the experimental number, and then have many, many theoretical parameters. It's the opposite. Have few theoretical parameters and have lots of different particle abundances which one can look at and see if it is right or wrong. The parameters which we will play with, if one believes a little bit in the simplicity of this picture, are the fugacities, the so-called temperatures, which are related somehow or other, as we have seen, to, temper to, temper to slopes, and of course, since we are actually dealing with the question, if we have this equilibrium system, we have to allow for being off equilibrium, which means that we somehow have to approach, in particular, the chemical equilibrium. So the, the, pro the problem of this morning, in my, uh, my mind, has been really how to use strangeness to disprove coagulone plasma. I mean, this is a little bit the reverse, perhaps, of what we have uh, been discussing, but I am looking at it from that point of view. There are three things in which we have failed. There is no single experiment in my mind which, has, which, I, which could be used to say there is no quark gluon plasma. Even at AGS, I cannot say that. I have been thinking about that a lot. I probably can say it at, at GSI LBL energy, but I don't have enough information to be able to say this, really. So we have what we are looking for. We are seeking, as a, let me give you three, three tests which may suffice. Maybe we have to do more tests than that, but they are already uh, quite comprehensive. One is that we are looking for asymmetry at finite baryon density in the abundance or structure of a phase space of strange and anti-strange quarks. Now, I like very much to speak there of something which is called lambda s, the fugacity of strange quarks. But you are free to think 
in non-statistical terms and view this lambda s as any collective type of parameter which describes the size of phase spaces, phase space of strange and anti-strange quotients visible to you immediately, that if you have finite baryon density, there is a difference because s quarks <coughs> like to sit in lambdas and s bar in kaons. And because of this, there's a natural asymmetry when there is a small system, small confined system, and a natural symmetry when there's a large deconfined system. We, we see, we would like to have, if we want to disprove quark gluon plasma, we like small yields of these particles which are called strange antibaryons, because that's what our instincts tell us we should look for. These particles are either not produced or already annihilated in a baryon-rich environment. So if I see someone produce a lot of data with very little or none at all anti-lambdas, anti-cascades, anti-omega, I would say, wonderful, we, this coagulum plasma idea is dead. But for the mere effect that people come day after day with new results, with this is actually a huge yield, I'm getting worried. And then, of course, there are lots of kinetic models. I mean, we have just seen RQMD and other results which we compare with. So it is another test. We build models, and then we discover if these models are right or wrong. Right? And now I would like to say that alone on these three categories, I don't see a single experiment which would disprove the this, the wild hypothesis for some, but for me the natural hypothesis of the confined matter. So what is our big trouble? Since we are seeking hadronic gas and not quark gluon plasma. It's the thing which we are really looking for. The big trouble is that thermal models do work. We have a slight disagreement between different groups. And we have seen, some of you might have seen this in Grazina, Jeans, and Roringer's lecture, but in principle, to a surprising degree, as things come in high energy and nuclear physics, there is agreement. So somehow or other, these main degrees of freedom have come to some kind of a thermal and even chemical equilibrium. Marek even went one step further, although he didn't write it down, I'll do it for him. He sees melted color. And the point that Walter Geis has made is he pointed out really that there's marginal variation in abundance of his particles. Now you can say, oh, this is in the means that if the same physics occurs in proton, proton, and nucleon, nu nucleus, nucleus interactions, this is actually true. Because that's what is we have to really to look for differences which are at a different level. We have to realize that in proton-proton collisions we have small volume and nucleus col nucleus collisions we have large volume. So we have to look what does large volume cause, uh, give us. For example, it reduces strangeness suppression. To see reduction of strangeness suppression, we don't, we, it's, it's not enough to look at lambda bar of a lambda. We have few degrees of freedom and we're moving to many degrees of freedom. That's not enough just to look at particular selection of data points. We have to look at a greater picture like Marek did. We are not quite near uh, or near equilibrium at all in proton-proton collisions. There are certainly quarks and gluons in proton-proton collisions. Are we in equilibrium there? Ben Miller would say yes. Hagedon would say yes. No, Ben doesn't say so. Jets. Jets. Good. In nucleus nucleus collisions, we are supposedly closer to thermal equilibrium. So you see, if we are trying to, dis to discover either hadronic gas or quark gluon plasma, we must remember at the fundamental level it's the same physics and we have to ask very specific questions which relate to these issues and therefore to remove the confusion which is obviously always recurring and recurring and recurring. Now I will address two issues which came up today in the morning session. So this is my point of view. And now to, the, to what issues we are really open. And I would like to address two subjects which are related to the new results. The one is, of course, the appearance of new ratios of strange antibaryons. We have seen anti-omega plus omega over cascade plus anti-cascade. 
And I did see a few days ago the anti-lambda of anti-P in Helsinki, so I will use it. And since it has not been shown today, I will just spend one second to show it. You did show it? I've almost thought you skipped it. Did she skip it or did she show it? She did. I have closed my eyes the moment you, you had it. OK, so let me, so that's the result. OK, so we have two, two new results. And then in theory, the question is, do we have any new handle on this uh, all the time question confined matter, which is proton kaons, neutrons, lambdas, and so on, versus large volume of matter, which is quark gluons and strangers. Is there any progress in that question? Let me start, perhaps, with the experimental issues. It's not very, let me remind you what the ratio is, what the Fugastis are. And I like very much to use the WA85 numbers, although equally well and very little difference I could use NA36 numbers. Somehow I got used to the uh, W85 in the central repetitive region. Now, the first thing to do if one thinks about the ratio of anti-lambda to lambda is, is that meaningful? And the meaningful means can we actually see a common factor as a function of mt? And I think in the lambda and anti-lambda case, I do have enough data to answer this positively. It is not perhaps perfect, perfect, but it's sufficiently well defined to say that there's a common factor as a function of mt. And therefore, I can actually say that measures, since I'm comparing abundance of quarks of s bar over s cube over q twice, it gives me a measure of fugacity. And once more, if I do it with cascades where I don't have such nice distributions, I get another expression. And if I combine these two, I do find simple relations which give me expression of lambda as lambda q, and these were the values which we have seen. And therefore, I can predict a lot of particle abundances. And this is what Jokli was telling me. Why don't you quickly show the predictions we have made? This is a paper. Unfortunately, this is an odd number page, so their names are not there by Josef Zolfrank, who is there, Uli Heinz, who sits there, Ahmed Tunzi, and Jean Letessier, so we are all here. And so a prediction has been made in such a thermal model, and this prediction is not dependent on what the source is made of. But all that is assumed is that in terms of that there's actually a temperature in the system, that there's chemical distri distribution of flavor, and that the strangeness as approaching equilibrium, not even the full equilibrium is not assumed. And so there were four, well, at the time we wrote this paper, there were four numbers, and of which three are linearly independent. There are three parameters. And there, there you see small stars. And therefore, there's no wonder that in various scenarios, everything can be beautifully fitted. So that's not a prediction, it's just consistency. But now come new results, and which test this hypothesis. They definitively came after this table was submitted for publication. There's not the slightest doubt that this is the case. So first, the lambda bar over p bar. The prediction is 1.2 plus minus 0, 0.1. The experiment is like this. Okay. You can argue about it that we were lucky, just chance. But you can also take it as some evidence, some confirmation within the large errors that there is a large number of degrees of freedom, and therefore that we are close to some, in some ways, close to thermal and chemical equilibrium, which is, was the basis of Jean Clemens's presentation. So while we wrote the paper and made the prediction, it is, was the basis of many lectures this morning. Then came today, a little bit later, this anti-omega to cascade ratio. 
Or I should perhaps point out that there was the anti-omega to omega ratio. See, there are three new results. The lambda bar to p bar, 1.1, 1.2. The anti-omega to omega 0.6, you look at the table. The Temple model gives you 0.85 plus minus 0.25, independent of the scenario, within one standard deviation. OK? Now, unfortunately, when we wrote this paper, we did not foresee that our experimental friends would, because of statistical difficulties, would have to combine omega with anti-omega. So we didn't actually give that result. We gave it separately. But you can extract, since one ratio is 0.5, the other is 1.1 in so-called explosion scenario. You can, what is explosion scenario? It is that you have a fireball at its maximum temperature. There's no flow. The system disintegrates directly. The more realistic case is a freeze out at 150 MeV, you are given in purple. The numbers are order one, quotation mark, and they are not in disagreement within this huge error bars which we have with the experimental data. And I should really point out that this order of one was to, can be found already in the paper of Koch Müller uh, of 986. It's not very surprising. It simply reflects upon the fact that all these quarks are equivalent in a soup of which I would call quark gluon plasma. So with this in mind, I would say, well, since these were the predictions, other people, of course, will of, may find that their models also agree with these predictions. But we have the advantage here that our degrees of freedom are those which are established for this kind of physics. So we like it very much. Now, if it, let me just switch, let me just now come to a little bit to the question of hadronic gas versus quark gluon plasma. And then the last, I have a few more minutes, six minutes. So it's, it's, it, is, it is, was a brief summary. First I gave you my point of view, then I gave a brief summary of what I view as important. And now I tell you in a few minutes uh, what one can actually, taking these results, consider as a possible scenario. Let me turn first to AGS. Steve Stedman gave his lecture, actually not in our session, but it was very much to the point. So I would like to address it as well. Is at AGS quark gluon plasma or hadronic gas? What is the situation? Well, we have been addressing this, Sean let us here, uh, Ahmed Tunzi and myself, uh, this question uh, for a long time. So we have two scenarios. Here is a freeze-out condition which has 13 units of entropy, which Johanna Stachel and Braun Munzinger got as well. We get it from, from different, slightly different perspective. Grazina has explained how this, this freeze-out point is determined. This is temperature, this is chemical potential. We know it is really happening someplace in this region, even though the ratio of anti-lambda to lambda is slightly changing. And so this, within an error bar, things are changing. Here, from, from this region, at AGS, these particles are emitted in mu and t. There's no question about it. But how did we get to this point? Did we go via the green path? Or did we go via the red path? As it turns out, both are nearly certainly possible. What is required for the quark gluon plasma path is essentially that at the time of freeze out, the particles stick long enough together, like in the model which was, uh, in, we were reminded of, which was developed the GSI, Free, Freeman, Knoll, and the third one was uh, Schultz. That these particles actually stick together long enough so that they can re-equilibrate. That's all that's needed. It's a nature of a phase transition which determines, in this instance, that we came through this. And they, we did a model of this as well. And it's perfectly possible at AGS energies. And actually, the remarkable results about the abundances of strange particles which are starting to come from AGS indicate that one is very, again, saturating the phase space there in strangeness. So the kinetic theory of strangeness production would suggest, indeed, that maybe quark gluon plasma is formed at AGS which would be quite surprising. But then, uh, I must stress, the nature of a phase transition would be greatly different. 
of a phase, I shouldn't say phase transition, I don't know it's a phase transition, of decomposition. If it's a so-called hadronic gas, the same curves come from very different regions of mu and t. And you can see easily that there's di enormous difference in mu will certainly be observable in some way by looking at penetrating probes, which Helmut likes to call penetrating probes, something which really probes deep inside the original fireball. We will see if that will be possible for the moment. All we can say is that it, from the kinetic theory of strangeness, this scenario appears to be possible. Now, if I compare AGS on the same type of a figure with a situation in CERN, this is the picture which presents itself. It's again from another paper by the same group of people. What we see here is now hypothesis of this coagulum plasma. And how does it compare to the situation at CERN? At CERN, again, looking at the globality of the results, we would have started someplace here, very much higher temperature. These are considerable differences, something which is different by ATMEV because all things happen to the power of four in temperature, we have much more energy density, much more balance, and so on. And you see here a slight difference. This is for sulfur tungsten, lead, and lead lead. So we have a power, predictive power to differentiate between small and large systems. The issue is really the freeze out point. You see, freeze out here occurs at much greater mu, which means much greater baryon density at comparable temperature with, as I point out, re-equilibration. At CERN energy, the freeze-out happens at much smaller mu, and certainly, if it, it has to happen, without re-equilibration, because of this very strong lambda s equal 1 constraint, which was pointed out by Grajina. All data from CERN have lambda s equal 1. There are slight disagreements about mu b's, which I can, may not be disagreement at all, may correspond to different bins in uh, rapidity. So with this in mind, I would like simply to say that I, I, mean, I have one transparency to actually to, uh, which I should show. Because Jean left us under the impression that as soon as one introduces gamma s, which is the approach to equilibrium, we still can live with a natural gas of hadrons. I don't think so. Even without considering entropy questions which Marek addressed. These really, I mean, one can look at them from different corners of phase space, and if I look from my corner of phase space, it is not possible to, from point of view of entropy, to live with hadronic gas. So I agree with Marek completely. But I would like to stress that even looking only at strange particles at a certain freeze-out point, it's very difficult if one makes a model which is terminal to live with a confined, confined system. And the reason is really that one has to interpret the slope as temperature. There was some time in past history a high temperature in the system. And the point one finds is here. And hadronic gas constraint for confined system is this region here. So at some point in the past, in its history, the source of these strange particles had to exist outside of the region within the hadronic gas tolerance. What Jean has shown is that it could, that this is the freeze-out point. He has pointed his finger to this blue dashed place, saying that all a particle balances are consistent with strangeness conservation and with this area. But the slope which you see, the, and which you have in such a model to interpret as temperature, forbids this interpretation. But that? It's my point of view. Uli is not responsible for this. But no, flaws, right? no, at some point in the past, the system, I am saying precisely what I try to say, as precisely as I can. It's my last but one transparency. At some point in its past, the system had to exist at this high temperature. Then it had to flow apart and disintegrate and freeze out. And it could have happened here. I have nothing against this. But it had to exist at this condition. 
and don't blame Uli for what I say. Last. There was a question by uh, Emmanuel Kwetzik about the future, essentially. And I would like to say that the future, of course, is let let. We have lots of predictions. People always ask for predictions. So we have worked for one year now to make lots of predictions. You can have everything. We are now, we have full description of the system. And I will not describe, and it's not as my lecture, it's a summary. This is, however, an answer to you. An answer which I already gave before. And you asked, why should we vary energy? As energy decreases, it certainly is not the same thing as very impact parameter. As energy decreases, baryon compression increases. Lambda Q increases, temperature will decrease slightly. For large volumes, which means that we continue to scatter lead on lead, gamma S remains near 1 if our understanding of the kinetic theory of strangeness production is correct. Therefore, the ratio anti-cascade to anti-lambda, which is probably the best compromise between what we want to measure and what we can measure. I mean, there are the two things which one has to consider. O omegas are already more difficult, as we have seen. Well, it is, in some way, very easy to predict, because it will measure lambda, the bar this uh, quark fugacity, the strangeness fugacity, and gamma s. And so there is a very immediate behavior we can anticipate. As we lower the energy per baryon, assuming that the baryon and energy stopping are similar, we are now around 9 GV in lead on lead. So as we lower this value, actually amazingly, this ratio should rise. There's nothing that you can do that will stop this behavior. It is absolute, and now you can of course say this is a particular model. The model is of the confined matter in a statistical equilibrium or very near to it. So therefore, one has to look at other models. And I can bet, although I have not done the calculations, that in, in most models which have confined particles in them, this ratio will not have this particular slope because it is contrary to what I have learned about particle physics. As you lower energy, it is more difficult to make anti-cascades and so on and so on. I don't need to explain this. So someplace, as we lower the energy, there should be a break in the behavior. Rather than to, this should, rather than to have negative slope, there should be a slight positive slope. And finding this place would be very interesting. And seeing if it is sudden and how sudden this would tell us something about the transition. There are other things one can discuss, but that's, I think, the most important point and an answer to what uh, Emmanuel asked us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. This is open for discussion. Helmut had a question. Yes, let me just return to this. I thought that after hearing a number of talks here that the inverse slope of the PT distribution is not immediately connectable to temperature, that you have to, uh, to freeze out temperature, that you have to say whether there is flow or whether there is not flow. Mm -hmm. If Uli says there is flow, then I take this flow into account and then after having accounted for this flow, I determine some other temperature. This temperature then, to be sure, is the freeze-out temperature and not the initial temperature. But how to take an inverse slow, an inverse temperature, uh, slope parameter from a PT distribution, make a model to subtract flow from that, make another model to say how the then emerging freeze out temperature is related to the initial temperature. This is something which is lots of fun, but uh, what that really tells us, I don't know. I mean, there are, th there are at least two very serious theoretical models between the data and the conclusion. And the conclusion may well be right, but to say that because somebody measures an inverse PT slope of 250 MeV, that this establishes that the system was at any time at a temperature of 250 MeV, I don't see, and it would be nice if you could explain that. Okay, 
I'm just about, I'm doing this, uh, uh, Helmut. The one-to-one -one relationship, of course, never exists in anything in physics. It's always an approximation. In lecture by Uli, we have seen one formula, which I have repeated here, which essentially says in a certain approximation, especially in the central rapidity region, when there's flow, the inverse slope relates to two quantities. The one is the freeze-out velocity, and the other is the temperature at the time the flow began. It's simply the, you can call it red or blue shift, depending how, which way you read the equation. Now, the slope which you see experimentally in transverse mass spectra is actually not the slope associated with T freeze, as his calculations show, but the slope associated with T0. Okay? It is not exactly to 100%, but if you see there are also effects which are coming from effects, for example, for deuterons, you have a slightly, you know, we have more boost. We have seen this actually in Stachel's lecture, that she was able to recombine all the different slopes which one sees at AGS into one, more or less one single temperature of a freeze-out, which was 150 MeV. The freeze-out temperature was 150 MeV, if I remember, and there were lots of different slopes, which you see. But the slope of protons, if you apply this formula, would, have, would give you the temperature T0, which was uh, at the beginning. You don't agree with this, will you? OK. Give it to Uli. Let me him contradict me. I mean, I'm, I must say that uh, I have to agree here with Helmut okay. that what you extract from the data is an apparent slope. And if you happen to know the freeze-out velocity from somewhere, you can get the temperature at that point. Mm -hmm. to, to extract from that temperature at freeze-out a value of the initial temperature, you cannot do without a model. And you cannot, you, you cannot assume that the apparent slope yeah. that is visible in the data has anything to do okay. with the initial temperature of the fireball unless you put a model in between. Fine. Then I, if, uh, when I apply the model that let us see had the privilege of introducing very briefly. And in this model, the temperatures which we have obtained are, by chance perhaps, exactly the temperatures which I have described for the HES and for the uh, SAN conditions. But this is not a dynamical model. It is actually a dynamical model, but I have, I mean, you would have had now to talk to him. Because just trust me for a moment, it's a semi dynamical model because we do apply the condition. That, uh, which, which is that the kinetic energy determines the pressure and the compression. Uh, I have two comments. Um, maybe we can uh, have a compromise on uh, this on point temperature? On, on the temperature <laughs> between the slope. As a matter of fact, we have for years already a quite detailed calculation. So we can go back yes. and interpret that. Yes. But for an argument at a cup of coffee, uh, the slope ar argument and uh, is uh, OK. And it gives you some intuition. Yes. So <laughs> let Thank us you accept very much. For, this <laughs> for this afternoon. Yes. Uh, my second comment refers to your question whether, as a matter of fact, uh, you uh, pointed out that we could try to define anti-signals. This is, uh, I yes. also thought for years about it. I never uh, was able to define an anti-signal for quark gluon plasma. Yes. However, to say that uh, if we don't see strangeness, we have such an anti-signal, uh, no, I don't think this is the right point of view. We, we, we see strangeness in PP collisions. Mm -hmm. And we expect that in nucleus-nucleus collisions, there are some collective effects. So there may be enhancement without necessarily having okay. quark plasma. Uh, uh, can I comment to this directly? We did calculations in the paper that Ben was referring to uh, earlier in these physics reports together, uh, which were based on kinetic theory, a little bit of kinetic theory and hadronic gas, and which I think for the time were very advanced. And in, in, in there, the yields of these strange antibaryons, like anti-cascades or anti-omegas, unless you assumed an, in a very long-lived system, we have a minuscule compared to what one finds today. So you can consider the to this to be an anti-signal. If it would have been found to be so small, we would have been, I mean, we would have buried coagulum plasma tonight. 
I bet that in a half a year you will have a model, a conventional model will, will give you these numbers. No, no, the point... This doesn't mean that the model is right. C can I make myself more clear, perhaps? Uh, the point is that if, I mean, a signal for hadronic gas with kinetic theory is a small abundance of anti-cascades and anti-omegas, a smallish abundance, we don't find it. Okay? Which is written in the paper. If it was redlich, if you may, may not have noticed. Yeah, we have a lot of questions, <laughs> and we are already eating into the coffee break. So please be basic and short. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe I have slept too much. Uh, what is T0? Is that the effective temperature which you see? OK, we have a source which at some point doesn't flow yet. It may have. Uh, you, it can flow in V long. I'm looking at the transverse right now. There's no V transverse yet. Okay? Now, I st there is, however, internal pressure. So this thing is going to expand in all directions. It will uh, therefore acquire a uh, velocity, which we also call, so this will become a much longer vector, which is now then longer, presumably, in someone's model, than V transverse. Okay? Now. Okay, T0, I understand perfectly. I didn't get to the point. T0 is the temperature which I have inside before I start flowing. Tf, and now I am, have flown to some system which is much larger, and particles disintegrate, and I'm getting out particles from the surface. And now, beta f, which I'm looking at transverse direction, is the velocity of the surface, and Tf is the temperature of the surface from which these particles freeze out. Now, Ben, again, let uh, Uli correct me. Now, this is not Give this is <laughs> then I think the formula should formula. be read otherwise. Other OK, way. correct me. Maybe it's a cup of coffee correction. Now, this formula up there relates the observed apparent flow TO of the spectra with the temperature of the system that frees out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I heard Jan saying that uh, the initial temperature was of order T0. Yes. He never actually computed it via that formula. He yes, estimated I, it. Yes. Maybe I we think we are back to the cup of coffee, yes. And uh, I had... Uh, yeah, I have more a question in the sense as an outsider to this heavy ion community. This word flow is somehow very specific to, th to the heavy ions. My question is, in many other collisions, one talks about jets. Is that perhaps the same thing? I mean, if you take a jet going outside, then you also have a transverse structure, which you could uh, associate to a temperature. But still, of course, you have some collective flow. So if, if this flow discussion has something to do with jets, I think one should address this question more directly and analyze to what extent uh, different uh, so-called flow components come from jets or are somehow associated to that. Have people thought about this connection between flow and jets? I cannot answer this question. Well, the uh, I can answer something to that. Jets is something. You look for jets in nuclear nuclear collisions. Transverse flow due to jets. Transverse motion due to jets. If you don't find it, but you observe the same effect you, you observe it, the effect in nucleus-nucleus nucle collisions, then it's not due to jets, but collective. So flow means more transverse motion in nucleus-nucleus than in nuclear nuclear. It's coming back to this discussion we had before about what is possibly the initial temperature. I mean, if we believe the system is in equilibrium, we can, of course, take the ratio of the energy density to the entropy density, and this is the temperature times the number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of data, if, if we believe we have something like a Burkean scenario, then that ratio is the transverse energy density to the multiplicity density mm -hmm. of particles. In fact, formation times and everything drops out. If you, if you apply this to to the data, you find something like 170 to 200 MeV uh, for both the AGS and SPS. 
Okay. I don't, uh, I would say, I just would say that what we have computed is, I mean, you know, specifically for our paper, uh, it's 190 for the AGS and somewhat more, 230 for the uh, SEN. So it is not entirely inconsistent. But uh, as you recognize, the issue is really the small difference. Mike is that's desperate. If, Uh, this plot that you sh showed mm -hmm. for anti-cascade over anti-lambda as a function of some variable that I didn't catch. Energy per baryon in the system. Well, Assuming that this energy per baryon doesn't change. Well, uh, the, this seem, what makes the big sharp transition? Uh, well, if you go from a deconfined system in which the strangeness, ki kinetic production of strangeness goes via the gluon degree of freedom to a confined system, in which the strangeness kinetic production goes via the collisions of hadrons. And uh, then in addition, uh, the anti-cascade and anti-lambdas have to be made by one or respectively two-step processes in hadronic gas, while they are some form of coalescence model uh, picture in the co-gluon plasma. That makes this great change. So in other words, if you go from deconfined to confined individual system, which energy this will happen? Notice, please, there's no... Yeah, but I mean, yet. if somebody could see something like this, it would be fantastic. Exactly. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. That's the reason behind... That is the reason why I am very keen to see the energy um, dependence of such an, excite, in other words, such an excitation function. That's about the SPS program in 96. Yes, this was an answer no. to the question. <laughs> let us talk our, let us thank our stimulating <laughs> chairman. Thank you.